Look at this! Hello. That's uh, six plus 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 show. We are coming together on the fly here. Uh, don't worry about it. This is what happens when Chris leaves us alone for even a moment. Uh, we cannot be trusted with these kinds of responsibilities, but we've made it. We're in. Everything appears to be working the way you would expect. So I am your host, Tom. I'm back again. I'm going to be talking all things 40k with some of my good buddies from the six plus plus team tonight. We are exactly as chaotic as we might appear to you here. Um, if you're listening in from somewhere, do let us know what you're up to to give us a shout out. It'd be nice to hear from you and, and to chat back across the episode. We are talking about one of the the great divides in 40k, the faction specialist versus army hopping mentalities um, tonight, which I think actually there's tons of really interesting things to say about, especially from a sort of competitive or developmental perspective, which is obviously an angle that we're really interested in covering. Um, I'm going to introduce our players and then we're going to do a little roundup of what's been going on with the channel um, and then we'll dive straight into it. So I'm going to start not where I always start because Chris is not here. Chris is off somewhere else. I'm playing him in a back rep tomorrow, so he's probably just practicing rigorously playing against himself as he likes to do getting ready for that um so i'll start instead with ed ed how are you doing my man i'm not bad i'm gonna apologize uh <laughs> i found out i was doing the the button push pushing three minutes ago and um... i actually think that's generous <laughs> <laughs> and since the last time i've done it um we've had a lot of upgrades behind the scenes so okay. um yeah no other than that all good uh played a game earlier of blood angels into death guard was fun. Oh, nice. Yeah, just my mate, I've been chipping away at convincing him to play something other than Chaos Knights because mm -hmm. there's just the fundamental, you know, you're, you're playing an army that doesn't play like anything else. There is a, realistically, a 3-2 or a 4-1 cap unless you're Josh Roberts because yes. you're just going to play against Iron Storm and lose. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. sucks. So, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've been doing. And which which is you piloted? Uh, I was playing the Blood Angels. Okay, cause... I was going to say, I thought for a moment we were going to get to call you out as playing Death Guard. I I, I'm quite keen to play them, but yeah, yeah, they are uh, emotionally, I don't know if my mate could handle that, because he's <laughs> played a lot of Chaos Knights, then I started playing them, and uh, it's not a lot of fun to practice into the same army that you, you know, you're playing no. yourself, so no, I'll, you know, I'll give them a, a miss for now and just beat them on Hypercrypt or something like that. Yeah, fantastic. And how did you find Blood Angels? Because they're also very exciting right now. A lot of fun. Um, I was playing the version with two ball predators, uh, and I just turned one part to them in the middle of the board and went, you don't want to walk out of your, you know, zone of control, <laughs> do you? You didn't want me to flame you to death. Well, that was good. Uh, good. Good times. A lot of fun tools in there. Yeah, bar presents are really good. Um, I'm also joined tonight by Jack. Jack, how are you doing, mate? I'm doing fantastically, Tom. Wonderful. And you have some very pretty artwork behind you. Uh, yeah, it's some original artwork. It's uh, yeah, it's painted for me, created a canvas, a nice little backdrop. Very, very cool. I was That's thinking cool. just before we came on, I think, yeah, you need to start playing slightly more evil armies now because that is quite a sort of sinister <laughs> and dark look. And I, I don't think the towel really would have much to do with that. It doesn't really feel like their jam. There's a more colourful <laughs> one on the back. I'll maybe I'll swap it around. <laughs> <laughs> a sort of greater good canvas. Wonderful. Have you played any 40k or done any hobbying lately, Jack? Uh, you went to Peterborough Slam 6 uh, the weekend. Yeah. Um, had a lot of fun there. Mm -hmm. um, Came, I believe it was tenth overall. So Very well done. Too Very bad. well done. Yep. Um, and then beyond that, I've just been, I've just been writing tau lists with the new tau codex. Um, mm -hmm. trying to mess around with that, see if I can find something that I'm, I'm happy with. Um, okay. Okay. but yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I've been up to. I've been playing crew. I've just, yes. uh, I've put, been putting the crew, um, foaming box together. Um, I've just put all the carnivores. Them and just zenith all of them. I'm going to contrast mm -hmm. them all over a little bit. Cause what sort of colors are you going for on your crew? Uh, they're like the 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 plague bearer green contrast paint. Okay. So it's like okay. a very very bright green. Yeah, it's uh, a lovely so. one that one. Yeah, fantastic. And how are the models to build and paint? It looks a very cool box. Uh, really good actually. The crew mm. go together really really well. It is one of those ones where they're a bit mono pose. Yeah. Um, there's like two. The head options are obviously all interchangeable, but the the arms there's like two sets of arms for each body kind of or one or one or two for each body um so there is a bit of variance in there mm -hmm. um but if you want to like switch up you're gonna have to like grind some arms down and green stuff a few bits if you want to yeah. like heavily vary it doesn't bother me um i if i need 40 of them i'll just have i don't know yeah. like three or four of them of the same i don't care but yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a hobbyist out there then that might be something that you care about for sure. Okay, excellent. And I'm also joined tonight. He's back again. It is the lovely Rob Kimpton. Rob, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good. Thanks. 
you change your camera angle, do you not want people coming in through your door whilst you're presenting? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a great little screenshot we got out of that, though. <laughs> um, break it in. <laughs> uh, what's new in your 40k life, Rob? Is anything interesting? Um, yeah, I'm still painting some Howling Banshees, getting my Eldar project off the ground. Almost mm-hmm. almost finished a squad of five. It's taking very, very long. I don't think I'm mm-hmm. ever going to finish this army. I have 2,000 points not. painted. Possibly um, not. Yeah, and I've played a couple of games of TTS, mm-hmm. um, played against Sisters, tried to go in all in turn one and failed a re-rolled six-inch charge. Oh, no. It's a Marco Flagellants. So oh, that, was, no. that was good fun. Oh, dear. Um, and then I had another game with Eldar, um, practicing for some... Uh, scrims that we got coming up. Yes, yeah, these are scrims with Luxembourg. We have made Rob take Eldari because Drakari don't pop up in many WTC8s right now, so we needed something that was a bit more of a done thing. Yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> it was into a lot, lots of Thunderwolf cavalry that ran very fast at my face. Yes, yeah, they uh, they will run. They will run. That does feel like a difficult one for Eldar. We'll get, get you some practice into something a little bit more reasonable um, soon. I've definitely True. been pl- playing on Truly the WTC I... boards. <laughs> Truly, I fear the Rob Kimpton that is freed from the shackles of Drukari. Yeah, and has, has finished his, um, you know, gravity training chamber. <laughs> you know, sit yeah. with Tywin. It's Did very, you know very scary. Do you know that every unit can actually do something in other armies? Yeah. Yes, it's just chaff and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, other armies have stuff that's job is not just to die in the way. It's, in, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that will be relevant uh, fodder for our discussion tonight. Obviously, Rob Kimpton, as you will know, listeners, is a Drakari all in faction specialist. He's played them as long as I have known him. Um, so he has seen the highs and lows of what it is to be a faction specialist for a very long time. So that's going to be really useful. Right, I'm going to shout out some people in the chat and then we will do some self promotion because we're very good at self promotion, possibly the best. We have Existence UK and we have Across the Tabletop. Welcome. We have Shiruni in. Um, Oh, across the table, it was painting Death Corp. Amazing. That's really, really cool. I saw some very nicely converted Death Corp Bulgrin the other day. They looked amazing with like all the gas masks. It's just, it's a really nice look on the models when you just go all the way across the scheme. Uh, Mr. Fellblade is in painting a Goliath truck. Very nice. We like a Goliath truck in this house. Me and Jack, both fans of the Goliath truck. Chris Cad is still listening whilst playing Fantasy Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. You are still distracting. That's a good thing. Yeah, we're still here to distract you. I'm glad that game is keeping you occupied. I did say some of, a few of the guys are playing it in the chat, and I kind of like. I feel like at some point there's been a branding failure with Final Fantasy because it just keeps happening. So there's not <laughs> there's not anything especially final about it um, at this stage. But by all accounts, really good games. I've never actually played Final them. Fantasy Twenty Seven. No, for real this time, guys. <laughs> you can trust me. It's the last one. Wait. <laughs> How much money did it make? We'll, it back. we'll, do, back. It, we'll do it again. This, this is the equivalent of gamer boomer humor. Right? <laughs> what the, what the lad? Oh no, am I crossing over the divide here into old age jokes? That's terrible. Oh god. Um, Existence UK is building a goblin boss on a giant cave squig. That's amazing. Uh, is that for Old World or for Sigma? Existence UK, let us know. I don't know how which ones have that one in, but I do know it's a beautiful model. Uh, and Jack is in. Good evening. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, do keep piping up in the chat. Lovely to have you here. As far as the Plus Roundup goes, we are continuing to have a really busy time of late. We've been making loads of content. Thanks very much to everyone for responding to it. We had the wonderful matchup plus plus, which is Jack's baby, go out this week talking about how to beat custodies, something we're all very deeply invested in. Um, and I think it was a really good episode. I feel like we covered some really interesting ground. So definitely check that out. If you've been bouncing your face off custodies and you want to know how to do it a little bit better or a little bit differently, I think we get into a whole bunch of their weak spots and vulnerabilities in that episode. Um, we also have the Tale of Six-ish Wargamers episode two. So our old world adventures continue. So if you want to see the gradual scaling up of our old world armies and the painting, the models therein, um, then do check that out. Spoilers, I didn't make it into this one because I haven't painted enough goats yet, but I'm going to come in really strong for the third episode with a thousand points because monsters are big and easy to paint. Um, and I think... I think we also have my Return of the Archon Part 3 coming out this week, I think probably tomorrow. Um, and we've also had the Cracking the Codex with Scouting Ahead with the Croot Hunting Pack um, has dropped since the last episode as well. So a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I know that Davey has a bug watch interview in the pipeline and I'm interviewing Liam VSL on Thursday night and he's going to teach me how to finally win games with Thousand Suns. So I'm really looking forward to it. In short, it's a very, very busy time. So please do keep hitting like and subscribe. Please do keep supporting. Remember that you can become a member if you are so minded. We've got a bunch of people supporting us on YouTube now. That helps us massively um, with our planning and our forward thinking as far as tech and support goes. So thank you so much for 
everybody that's tuned in with that so far. Um, and you can obviously leave super chats as well. No one's bought Chris a hat yet. I'm devastated. Um, it's such an easy opportunity to make Chris wear a hat for an undefined amount of time. So someone needs to take us up on that eventually. Um, Ed's leaving now. Uh, oh, no, he's coming back. He's done a, he's done a switcher. Oh, he's got his, oh, it's his hat. It's his Make Orcs Great Again hat. That's amazing. Your faction specialism. <laughs> <laughs> I did see a little bit of Ed the Orc player popping up in the chat this week in a burst of a flurry of excitement and energy um, as, as leaks from the new Orc book came out. Um, do, do you want to have like a quick five minute rundown on the, the reviews that we've seen disparate, how exciting one is and how absolutely fucking soul destroying <laughs> the ones that we've seen today are? Should we have yeah. like a quick yeah, let's, two minutes? Let's briefly, let's briefly hot take it, shall we? Let's go. So Orcs and Custodies are obviously coming out. We've seen some stuff from both. Ed, you play both these armies. How do you feel? Um, one of them I'm quite excited about, and it's it's not the one I want to feel excited about. I'm really enjoying <laughs> playing Custodes at the moment. There's a great match at Plus Plus, as you said, just come out. Yep. Um, I think the real thing <laughs> to do might be wait six weeks <laughs> and then just not care. Um, yeah. We've seen we've seen that there's going to be a grand total of four detachments for Custodes, and two of them are shackled to sisters. Now I don't uh... know if you've seen the rules for sisters. The one wound T3, three up save models. Yeah, I've only That's ever seen them gold. as an action monkey or a throwaway objective holder, so it's hard to imagine a detachment based fully around them is going to yeah. have a great time. Um, That's interesting. What do you think, Jay? Right. <laughs> Games Workshop really saw the reaction to the Tau Codex with their four detachments, where one was tied to a bunch of models <laughs> that people don't necessarily want to use unless it's a meme. And then they were like, ah. I see people don't like that. Well, perhaps we'll try two of those to double down. And perhaps double down. people yeah. will enjoy it then. Yeah. Um, no, no, don't, don't be daft, Jack. There's such a lead time that we know that's not possible. What <laughs> it is, it's the ramping decision that they've gone with that all the cheap units are going to have their own detachment and it's going to spread through the codex. So there's going to be four, four detachments in the Chaos Codex and three of them are going to be cultist focused. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly that. And then when they get to GSC, I think they'll probably just do a whole bunch of Goliath Rock Grinder themed attachments and go, go, go in the other direction. Just just that's just keep, keep them back. <laughs> yeah, it's just, they've fallen off the end of the scale. They've come all the way back around. It's rock grind. You can have ba battle line, take six rock grinders, go nuts. It's all going to be very reasonable. Um, but I mean, I guess, so commenting on the rules that you've seen then, Ed, what are we thinking as a very early citer of these two books? How, how are you feeling? For custodies, I hope that the other two detachments are good. Okay. That's, that's all I can say. Like mm -hmm. nothing I've seen so far for the, the two that they've sort of vaguely talked about have been interesting at all. Orcs look mm -hmm. fucking incredible, though. Like, yes. So we've got Dread Mob, where you go, I can have either lethal hits, sustained hits, or um, AP, an additional AP2 mm -hmm. on crit wounds, I think it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I lost interest after the first two, because the first two were just really good. Yeah, yeah. You can either roll a die, or you can just say, I'm having that one. If I pick that one, I become hazardous. Cool. Yeah. Don't value my life at all. Yep. Not a problem. <laughs> um, That's the best thing about it is just how much hazardous is going on. <laughs> yeah. uh, are we are we looking for just you know eighteen killer cans in Dread Mob? Yes, we are. Uh, and then also Gorkonauts, Morkonauts whatever else you want to fit in there. I'm hoping that they give Stompers a points cost that's approaching a reasonable level. Since I've played the game, you know, back, you know, yep. rejoining an eighth, they've been unreasonably expensive. <laughs> they can like I don't know what a Catan cost. <laughs> 255 i reckon that's a fair comparison um because yeah. if you put lethal hits on all of those guns suddenly i don't care that you're hitting on fives it'll be yeah. uh it'll be good and then obviously there's the um the detachment that there's going to be three or four people you know the usual suspects running in the uktc where there's just going to be 250 green models on the board or the five up uh, in fun that's going to be something that I'm going to have to play against, and yeah, that exists. Play myself. Reminder that Mech Boy Mega Nobs have a two up save and a four up in run, um, so that's that's a thing. Uh, let's see how let's see how that combos. I think there is there is some keyword stipulations for all of this, so we'll have to see. Um, but it certainly looks very exciting. And when Rob and I were looking through the index when I played Orcs the other day, sort of trying them out, there is an awful lot of strength nine AP two damage three shooting in that book. So stuff that suddenly turns that into even more dangerous. It's, Plus one to it's wound and damage. Really, really interesting. And Dread Mob looks like it'll be a lot of fun. Um, a very exciting news, by the way, for our chat because Scary is in the chat. Scary says hello. It says poster boy for faction specialist checking in here. I think probably the faction specialist, um, the, probably the most iconic one I can think of in in forty k. So an absolute pleasure to have you in here, Scary. Um, Big fan um, of orcs, isn't he? 
Oh, he loves orcs. Yeah, an, orc, an orc main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, obviously, I big part of the reason I even played Drakari is, is Scurry. So it's a good example of how infectious faction specialism can be, how in, how exciting you can be about an army um, through thick or thin. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Scurry has to say about our conversation tonight. Um, and Mr. Felblow says, just to clarify, Chris has to wear a hat that is exactly the cost of the Super Chat. It was never specified, Mr. Felblow, but I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say that's exactly how it works. <laughs> Um, and we'll go we'll go from there. Existence UK says my heart says dread mob, but I suspect the bully boys will be the best. You might be right. Um that whole what Hot take. You know, we'll see. Yeah, go on. I don't think they're gonna be that good. You don't think they're gonna be that good? I don't think a five plus symbol on all those guys is that is that good. <laughs> me, me, and Robert, reason, me and Rob are certainly well up for it. The carry. reason I say that <laughs> the reason I say that is because it's not too different. From a five up field of pain, it is better, obviously. Mm-hmm. But like the a lot of orcs used to have a five up or six of field of pain anyway, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and it's kind of similar. Like you so... can have both though. It's you it's, have it's both. rack spam two point oh. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, plug a plug a pain boy in. It's a lot. It's, it's, it's a only lot. on it's only on models of the boys keyword, which I think is one data sheet, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's only twelve hundred you... boys for one hundred and twenty. 1200 points for 120 snagger boys. It'll be fine. Yeah, do, the beast snaggers snaggers get the boy, <laughs> do the beast snaggers get the, the boy uh, keyword? Well, it's less if it's on the I'm other not boys sure, anyway. actually. No, I don't think they do it current, but I wonder if they do in the new rules, because if they do, zug zug. Yeah. Is it yeah, I just... It says bully boys is double wah for knobs and mega knobs. What about second wah? Very, very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> very, very intriguing. I love how that's the, the joke that everyone goes with. I thought I was really clever when I made that joke. Yeah, yeah, you no, went, me too. Yeah, no. Nobody <laughs> thought it was funny when I said it. <laughs> but it is good, isn't it? It's just, yeah. I mean, you, you're going to have to say it every time. If you're playing orcs and you don't say what about second wah when you're declaring your second wah, <laughs> you're not my friend. So. Oh, and then you no. can look to your buddy that you've turned up <laughs> no, no. to your buddy that you've turned like, yeah, comes to realize, I, I, I think you just clicked at the same time for me and Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Jack. <laughs> People are going to be yelling wah through the tournament. They are. Twice that, a that game. guy that screams wah now gets to do it twice per game, which means that at GT you are hearing that ten times. That is very fun, isn't it? That's Game, <laughs> Games Workshop, why do you give your strongest soldier the hardest battle? <laughs> Fuck off, Tau player. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Truly, I struggle. But yeah, I think um, I always had a good feeling for Orcs in this edition because it just feels like the way they've done detachments was tailor-made for an, a model and army range that wide. Um, mm. And I think it'll be really interesting to see. And con- conversely, something like Custodes doesn't have as many things to do and there's not as many different directions you can take it. Although I'd love to see like a bikes detachment. Just give, they had, make, make bikes do cool things. That's all they I want. They had six detachments in ninth edition. They did. And they seem to have gone, we didn't like any of those ideas. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen the last two, so I'm pinning my hopes on that. But like, fucking hell. Yeah, Wait. Jack. Jack in the chat by the way says I played against a Waha once. Uh, not good for my hangover. Yeah. So what I find is I don't mind them on Saturday. I dislike them on Sunday. If they're still wowing on Sunday when I'm a bit tired and fragile and it's getting difficult to play, I don't like that. Don't like that. That's when I'm at my most vulnerable. It may right. shock the viewers that I'm against wowing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, does that can you even be an orc main if you're definitively against? I mean, I know John Scrivens also doesn't like it. To be fair, let me let me come to you with sixty ten mil dice, and uh, <laughs> then we'll talk again. <laughs> so you're like my orc main. Wonderful. Okay, right. I think Scrivens is in the chat. And he says he hates it. Fair enough. Right. We are going to get into the conversation today. So obviously, I mean, I titled this as faction specialist versus army hoppers, and I think. What we'll be trying to do is, A, get a sense of what these terms even mean, how we even define this. And I think that in itself is quite telling, and we can kind of stretch the limits of what these terms mean a little bit. But then I guess it's useful to think in terms of, say, we're interested in development, we're interested in competing at six plus plus. So what are the implications of these different approaches? What are the kind of consequences? What are the pros and cons? What sorts of things do you as a player pursuing either of these bear in mind? Now, Jack is... Jack was always going to be very keen to talk no, in this episode. This is, no, 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 this is, you're putting your hand up, which I respect. So let, let's is, have it. Go on. This is, I just want to. I just want to table something, right? Because I know we, we, we do okay. um, army okay. faction versus, versus yep. so faction specialist versus army hopper. I want to table the idea that we instead of calling people army hopper, because I think that has like a derogative like connotation to it. Okay. We say okay. faction uh, opportunist. Okay. Okay. Does that sound better? 
<laughs> I, I think know, that sounds I, bad. I think I think I think I see what you mean, and I think there's implications in there that are useful. And I think so. Yeah, I mean, let's let's start with Army Hopper because again, I didn't want to use Meta Chaser because that's so often used pejoratively, right? There's often a very pejorative yeah. application, but it, I mean, fundamentally, we're talking, aren't we, about people who switch armies very regularly. Um, especially in a competitive setting, and are switching armies in pursuit typically of competitive advantage. And I don't know what you guys think. Is that is that a fair way of defining uh, faction opportunists? Yeah, I mean that makes makes sense to me. Ultimately, it's people who I would probably say swap probably every data slate. Roughly, it's probably okay. okay. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a good kind of bar for that. I think that's mm-hmm. pretty common. Yeah. Um, for people yeah. who who have a lot of factions who'd like to, to swap a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, Ed, Ed, how often do you swap? Uh, what, three weeks. Three weeks. Uh, it depends. Because if I if I find a faction that I really like playing, I'll stick with it for ages, and then mm. they'll do something stupid like bring a new edition out and uh, kill any interest I have in playing Tau ever again. Um, ah, yeah. yeah <laughs> shame. Because I was I was on Tau for about eight months, but uh, yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, like I was only on Necrons for a couple of events, and then. They changed things that made them not enjoyable in the mm-hmm. way that I wanted to play them. Now mm-hmm. I'm playing Custodies, and then they're going to kill Custodies. So what I'm saying is it's not my fault. Games Workshop <laughs> has it out for me, personally, um, which is entirely possible, actually. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I should probably and stop talking. We've got a couple of qualifications. I mean, I think the data slate timing is actually really interesting because, yeah, obviously now we have these really regular chunks and windows. You can very much see that process, right? There is often a sort of creative energy of, oh, that's got a buff, I'm going to go play that, or all oh, that's got nerf, I'm going to drop that, play something else, um, which I think, yeah, lots of lots of players with multiple armies are very much in, in tune with. Scrivo also says data slate or new codex. Yes, Scrivo. That is absolutely true up to a point. Um, but it depends on what codexes are doing, doesn't it? Because I say we've seen an interesting phenomenon in this edition where some codexes don't give players what it is they're looking for when they arrive. So actually it's a moving away from codexes um, rather than jumping onto them. Um, But certainly ninth was very much defined by the top of the game being, oh, the new book's out, smash everyone with that. Then the next book's out, it's got the counter to that, smash everyone with that, and round you go, right? I think as a general rule, I think Games Workshop has gone out of their way to avoid as much yeah. codex creep as possible. I think that's edition. right. I, I think it's I think it's just Necrons that are the outliers being really good. Yes. And then Admech being not good in the other direction. Everything else is like quite squished together. Yes. I think. Um obviously new books notwithstanding, the code the custodians and all I'm not talking about those. But yes. um yeah, the ones that are released all seem to be like fairly close in power level. So I think that kind of curtails that a little bit but that that gets sort of um mitigated by the fact we have the data slates come out and the data slates are now the more the meta shifter rather than the codexes where they were i completely agree yeah. so yeah you end up with um like weird um jumps like people like everyone went to um obviously elder was, everyone's on elder at the start yeah and then we had you know our first data slate elder got nerfed a bit people discovered that chaos were good because that would they didn't get any changes but people just discovered that that was just a normal yeah. meta revolution and then um they would have abandoned them essentially yeah. um now they've got changes but um i think this is a, this is just one of those things where i think for, chaos is a good example because they're not they're not bad they're just not interesting anymore because they've mm-hmm. been nerfed so mm-hmm. um people are going to jump up because i think that's kind of part of the reason why people jump a lot is that those factions that generally have a lot of power are more interesting to play. Yes. Um, so, and there is, I think, there is an extent with with faction swip swapping in general, where, as you say, it's not purely about competitive strength. Some of the time, it's about a new challenge. It's about trying something different, sort of stretching your capacity or your abilities. Um, I definitely found when I was first getting into the game, it's just very exciting falling in love with like a different rule set or a different set of abilities. It's quite fun, sort of trying to solve something, isn't it, and dig into it. And so there, there are motivations for switching between armies that aren't purely about strength but i think strength and perceived strength especially and actually perception is a big part of this right it's not always purely about how good something is as you say i played against chaos space marines in peak eldar meta and i came away from that going i went and told leo's like you know this is going to be incredible right this army's got everything it's going to be one of the best armies in the game and it it straight up was um for many many months before eating a bullet unfortunately um Let's take it to this faction specialist side of things. How do we define what makes a faction specialist? Because this is kind of interesting as well, right? 
Obviously, we've got Scary in the chat, so Scary's one. <laughs> but that's a that's a very strong example where it's like you know, the the actual personality of a content creator and personality in the game is almost you know singularly attached to a given army. I think you've got to oh, sorry. you've got to play them a lot. Uh -huh. You've got to win a reasonable amount of games. Like you're not okay, a faction okay. specialist if you're just a dedicated orc player. You're just so an success orc is, who likes success a is actually attached to this. Then we think. Well, like if you think about factions where people, you know, you, you have orc players who've been playing orcs for five years and they've probably won five games across. And they those wear five cowboy years. hats. I've seen them. And they have a great. I wish I had that much fun playing Warhammer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with or without, you know, shouting war at the top of my lungs. Uh, <laughs> so I think you have to have some su success. And I think you've got to be willing to iterate and not necessarily be alone in developing lists, but when, you know, changes in the meta come, work out what you can do for it and and run different lists and find new ways to play the faction. I think that, for me, yes. makes a faction specialist. And this is this is one area I really want to pick up on when we get to the kind of the strengths and weaknesses, but I think that's right, because I think a lot of the time, if you are a faction specialist and you play a faction sort of weather-dependent, as it were, whether it's good or not, um, you often do have to do that creative work on your own because you don't necessarily have a Discord buzzing with people that think the army is really good and are excited to try X, Y, Z. You don't necessarily have all the hype and noise around it, which means you have to solve problems on your own. Um, but actually, I do think in the end, the skill set that connects the two meets there to some extent. But that is something we definitely associate with faction specialists is they can, they can iterate, they can innovate, they run things their own way, they have a clear sense of how they want to play. Rob, you were going to come in on this as well. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say effectively that said it's it's getting results and also um, it's sticking with the faction in the low points as well. That I think that's a yeah. huge defining factor of yeah. But, you know when you are down in the dumps with your faction, you see it as a challenge. You don't mm -hmm. go, oh no, I, I need, I'm not going to win games with this. Like, actually, how can I rock up to a table? People are going to think this is an easy win. Mm -hmm. They're easily, they're easily going to get a fifteen five. And, <laughs> Actually, no, it's going to be a very close game or I'm going to pull something mm. out that they don't mm -hmm. know. And that, yeah. for me, faction specialism is just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. And I think that's it. It's playing an army often well above and beyond its perceived ceiling mm. um, and being willing to do the work with it even when it's in a difficult place or a less optimal place. Um, and as you say, at some stage, I think with specialism, you are prioritizing your you know, connection to that army over its perceived success or results right you're making that decision yeah. um and it means you're not just there for the good times um and obviously with 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 our, our beloved drakari as, as scary in the chat will also know you know there was there was a very hot uh start to a year not so long ago when that code ninth code i found it in the garage actually today i was going through finding bits for our back row tomorrow <laughs> and i just saw the ninth edition drakari because i was like oh you, you monster <laughs> looking back up at me with all its powerful powerful rules um, but obviously, suddenly, Drakari became a really, really played and covered faction for the best part of a year, right? But have now dropped right back down to being a very, you know, very small percentage of the game and, and low number of players. Um, and I think something like Harlequin's probably quite similar, right? Again, that had a big boom, but was not typically a very commonly played army. I think uh, to 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 put out a a controversial opinion again uh, i'm just <laughs> that's, I'm what, just that's what you're here for jack i pretty much wrote this for you so you just go nuts <laughs> i i think you can be a faction specialist in more than one faction because i think in order to yes. be a faction specialist you basically have to master the faction yes. which ultimately comes down to how much you can play the game mm -hmm. for example i think a good example of this is actually um innis wilson right because he's probably okay, very a good, very good he's a space marine specialist i would say right yeah. he's played space marines a lot but he probably is also a Tyranid specialist because he he's also played Tyranids a lot. Yeah. So, but he also plays the game like every single day, <laughs> probably yeah. more than once a day. Yeah. So, and like, so most people can't keep up with that, and so they yeah. wouldn't be able to become a specialist or master yeah. in in any one faction. But I think it also kind of ties in with what um, Rob said as well, where you can't really master a faction truly. I don't think unless you've played it when it's not the best army in the game. I completely agree. because. It's that old adage that adversity breeds uh, innovation, right? Yeah. You're not going to learn the the best ways to not just like list innovation, but just like the best way to play, like the movement tricks, the different like um, edge case uses for stratagems or enhancements yeah. or, or different units and stuff like that. You're not going to learn that unless you have to really struggle to get those wins. Yeah. So I think, I think, I think playing the faction when it's not so good is kind of a key aspect. 
of I becoming agree. a specialist. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think I, you know, we, we, we had the metaphor of weight training earlier, but actually I think that's spot on with faction specialism a lot of the time. I think, I think when you commit to just playing an army meta be damned, that often means playing uphill into things which are present a very real challenge that are, is often extremely difficult to deal with, right? And that there you learn a lot and gain a lot from doing that. And when, when we start thinking, you know, what the pros and cons are, I think that's that's a big part of it. And that's certainly, and I don't think, again, you don't have to purely be playing one faction. You could also just be selecting to play not as good factions and, and making it, and you're still going to come up against those kinds of concerns. But as you say, it, it's in fact, you don't have to be a single army player to be a faction specialist. And ultimately, yeah, it probably does come down in the main to how often do you play it? How deeply do you understand it? Right. How bedded in are those sort of fundamentals? Um, and those can carry across time. I think isn't the the real secret to it that there's not actually that many playstyles in Warhammer. So, <laughs> like, are you just a playstyle specialist? Are you yes. uh, a Trixie yes. faction with your glass cannon boats? Oh, hey, that covers like four di- four different armies. Ooh, or are you uh, go uppy downy shooty? Uh, yes. Hey, we've got hypercrypt and we've got grey knights doing the exact same thing. Yes. Uh, Increasingly large number of armies yeah. that that comes. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say. I feel like yeah, I feel like the, the gap between certain armies, especially with detachments, is is often less now in certain ways as well, right? And there's mm. there's definitely detachments that look and feel. But yeah, I think playstyle specialist is. I mean, an example that springs to mind would be someone like Sean Naden, right? Where it's like he plays orcs and he also plays Tricari, but it's like he will flood tons of stuff at you and absolutely out, you know, outdo you with transports and activation and all that stuff. And that's mm. the style he evidently really likes. Yeah, I'd um, say that's where I fall at the moment. Although I'm okay. looking to change that because I go, "What's the yeah, most that's probably fair. correct that is fair. meat that mm-hmm. I can put in the center of the board?" And just say, "No, you don't get to have any primary, and uh, we'll, yeah. work, we'll worry about the rest later." And that statistical viewpoint, I think, is probably more of an um, a faction opportunist thing. I think, which is, but it, again, it it gets into the heart of this, which is that ultimately for all the dressing we put on armies, we put fancy names on them, we give them cool models, they have a whole lore behind them, but they also boil down to rules and numbers, right? And that's that's ultimately what they what they have, and the skills and the understanding of those carries over across armies, and you can find things that you like. Um, you know, it, it, across multiple different armies. And as you say, styles lend themselves to particular ways of doing things. Are you all about durability? Are you all about speed? Are you all about kind of sequencing and trick tricks and all of that kind of stuff? Um, and so in that sense, again, yeah, sometimes I think, again, there's a few players I know who started playing CSM early this edition. Like, well, this this feels actually more like Ninth Drakari than Tenth Drakari do at this moment in time because Chosen yeeting out from somewhere and running across and punting something uh, was something that Incubi at that time could not do. <laughs> so, you know, if you're if, if actually what you were is an advance and charge and slap you in the space, but in the face specialist, then that book made a lot of sense, right? And it was a kind of a kind of logical change and move in that sense. All right. Okay. I mean, anything to add on the definitions front before we get into thinking what the kind of ups and downs of this are? Okay. Let's start with changing armies frequently or our faction opportunism. What are the benefits of doing this? If we start with the positives, why is it good or useful to do this? Uh, You get a real broad understanding of the mechanics of the game as a whole, I think. I think so. Yeah. It's quite useful, and this is something I've, because obviously, you know, I've changed armies plenty of times over the last few years as well, and one thing that you get from doing that is a real sense of what an opponent playing that army does not want and does not like, and that's really, really useful. Like, when I play against Drakari or Eldar, I know exactly what they don't want to be happening to them, because I play those armies in depth, and that's very useful, and that's quite useful in learn knowledge, and that is where, ultimately, I think, you know, whether you're a specialist or someone who changes armies all the time, until you understand other armies really deeply, you're going to struggle playing into them. And one good way of doing that is to play those armies as well <laughs> and, get, and get a sense of how they work, right? Cool. What other, what other kind of advantages or benefits are there? I think the, the super obvious one is you get better results, right? Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's just be, let's be super clear. Like, yeah, I yeah, think you've got to play the 60% win rate faction. Exactly. Yeah, exactly there's, yeah. there's a reason why when you look at the, the best players in the game, if you look at, if you go to the UK TC rankings, look at the top 10, you know, you're, at your inner sports, as I said, the your jack tights, so on and so forth. Um, they play a whole bunch of different armies, yeah. right? And there's a reason why there's something. It, it's going to push your performance up um, because the reason I, I think one of the biggest reasons that factions are good is because they cover 
mistakes they, they are very forgiving of yeah. mistakes Completely. so um when i think when you play a lot of factions you end up with like a very wide um skill pool but it's yeah. very shallow i agree um, with that yeah particularly because if you're playing something when it's good um you're only going to play that faction in one play style right so like when chaos were good they had the the forge fiends the shooty obliterators all that sort of stuff um so it's very shooty csm right but you didn't really play the sort of melee lists kind of like the pure melee list the traditional chaos no. um, uh, chaos space marine lists yeah um so that's not like a skill that you you pick up no that, i'm going to raise sense. you as well when a curse cultist was thing you just won the primary by turning up as well and that was that was <laughs> that, that was really nice and i you know you watch what, what you watch and a ton of games with lots of a curse cultists and you're like you know this is this primary game just plays itself really you just have more oc than anyone on a point and it can then go and get and batter their point and you do that several times and next one players very- fully shook just every time <laughs> like i i was stood playing lee uh go yeah no this will be fine and then they just got into me and went oh no this isn't fine at all this this is yeah. actually horrendous but yeah, so I think I think that's right, Jack. I think it's it's often a very forgiving if you, if 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 you're jumping specifically because things are overtuned or undercosted or too good, you are simply playing an easier game more often a lot you know a lot more of the time, um, and so the results are better. You breeze through those early rounds, um, the first three rounds of the GT where I took light Harlequins, release light Harlequins were the most <laughs> one sided massacres I'd ever played in my entire life, and it was just like this is this is horrific. Like this, everything about this is absolutely awful. Then I hit Lee Church with faction specialist and he demolished me and it was beautiful um <laughs> you can end up with a a lot of the time that it can push you up like a whole other win bracket right like a three two to a four one or a four one to a five oh like they can mm. it can literally be that much of a difference by mm. by being an opportunist and going to that faction that is, yes. is having more success success or has like a sort of build renaissance in the way that um chaos space marines did yeah. In the second day of sleep. yeah, I think completely so. And I think there's at the top of the game when certain armies are really strong, you get that phenomenon where players whose win rates are not normally high are suddenly high. Whereas I think with faction specialism, we tend to have the associated the other way around, right? Where players that really know the army actually add something. And you'll see, you know, they're adding 20% to what an army is actually pulling at normally for data, right? Um, but you don't get that much. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's much less common. Um, for that sort of just sudden, the army is carrying you upwards when it's it's your own army, unless it suddenly gets really really juiced up out of control. Um, and so yeah, I think I think that's very relevant. I do think um, stuff's falling down somewhere. Eddie, have you got stuff that's falling down? <laughs> I, I heard it, and I just looked. In the, I could see in the corner just like a, an empty cup. Going, duh, duh. <laughs> yeah. Chaotic energy. It's going oh, ghosts man. in your house this week. Yeah, you love to see it. I, it's actually I've got the window open. It's pissing freezing, uh, and I'm like I, I could close this, but it's all the way over here, and I can't I can't reach it. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the ghosts of armies past that <laughs> there's abandoned in his. <laughs> oh, God, buggies. Really in. This is quite a small room. There's not going to be enough room for me in here with all these. <laughs> the entire thing is just going to fall down behind you. Uh, I was going to say there is there is one very positive side effect of the results boost effect, which is something I definitely felt when I because I was. I was relatively new at the game still when Drakari got jacked up the first, in ninth edition. And what I suddenly found was I would just be hitting these players at a different level to what I was used to. Right, I'd, I'd have a few easy games and then I would suddenly hit this steely face person who's thought about nothing else but how to destroy raiders and kill everything in it. And then they would demolish me. And so there's a level of play that you then start encountering, um, which you may not, if you're scrapping around, you know, trying to get to those later rounds with an army um, and you, you're not sort of hitting very very top players that can itself be an issue so i think it's it's it can be a shortcut to playing into much stronger players um, which in turn can level you up because i think playing strong players is the way you level up above above all else so that definitely is one upside to doing it um what else do we think are there any other kind of positives or advantages to it so is that to um opportunities in general yeah still still on opportunism in general yeah. okay yeah, yeah um i think you end up with a, a, a i think as rob said before you end up knowing what a lot of factions just do right you end up mm-hmm. learning a lot of matchups um mm-hmm. kind of in as a so you, you add a, add more like knowledge to the repertoire basically because mm-hmm. you end up um 
I'm trying to think of a, a way, best way to word this. Um, when you have more like different matchups of loads of different factions, it makes it easier to predict how matchups are going to go. Oh yeah, because um, you you know how these armies interact with each other yeah. a lot more um, rather than having the uh, just because you have a lot of knowledge about different. Uh, yeah. I, I think I think another advantage in that sense is also that it's just if a meta suddenly changes in a way that you're like I need X tool, and your army maybe can do a bit of that, your favorite army, but actually maybe it doesn't do it very well, uh, and actually a different army you play is suddenly in a really ideal place for that. It's just it's just, it's rather than oh, I'll change two hundred points to my list and hope that's enough. It's I just have the thing that deals with this right, and as you know, you see you see very successful kind of high ranking players do this all the time where they just pivot to something that just very adroitly counters what's already out in the meta right it's definitely so it's something that happened to me accidentally with gsc at one stage where i'd been slaving away with gsc for ages and then suddenly after they got a bunch of buffs it was like oh these just demolish harlequins and tyranids and a whole, a whole bunch of things that have been really horrible for ages and suddenly they're in this amazing spot in the meta where they were a really good tool for dealing with those things um and so it's you can get those moments in a meta if you have more tools to reach for i guess i think an example of what i'm saying is i i thought this while you were talking the uh so for me as a tower player right let's say mm -hmm. i'm playing against dark angels or the new dark angel codex i've not played against the new dark angels codex because i don't think anyone has um, <laughs> I, I literally but, haven't <laughs> ever played it no. i might you... i might just never play against it and just call it a day um if you ask me to name all the Dark Angels units, I couldn't do it. I don't know what they are. I just don't know. Um, That's so... the easy bit. Try naming the <laughs> fucking detachments. Like, at least the models are interesting. You know, the models look gorgeous. The the aesthetic's fantastic. Uh, you know, they've got this real, like, knightly vow going. And then, But the rules, the rules are terrible. Couldn't tell you those. It's it's not a little guy in a big robot, so I don't care. Um, so... <laughs> in, a, in a robe. Um, so... What, what I mean is, is that if I, if I haven't played against the Dark Angels Codes before and I come up against it, I, there's going to be a bunch of units there that I have no real context for what they do. Yes. But um, if you're an army opportunist and you say, you, say you play Dark Angels at the end of last edition, you know what all the Dark Angel units are and yes. you know kind of roughly what they do. And if yes. you own a Dark Angels army, you probably at least leaf through the codex to see what your um, the army, the models that you own do. Absolutely. So you kind of like have a general idea. So if you're yes. going in with zero knowledge, I think you have like a slightly a slight leg up on someone who is a faction specialist in Completely. that case. Yeah, I think so. There's there's a sort of baseline kind of muscle memory, isn't there, for a faction? Like what 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 are the units? What are their assigned roles? What what are the basics I'm expecting from this? Yeah, even like the basics of I think um a good example for this is uh like Chaos Knights. Yep. Like God, for so long I didn't, I just couldn't tell them. But I don't even know which knight was which. I'm like, okay, they're all <laughs> war dogs, and that's what they are. Um, it's really simple. One's got guns, one doesn't. Yeah, for, <laughs> again, for for a Chaos Knight player, it's very simple. But for someone who has never played Chaos Knights, yeah, learning them quickly was just like, wait, which one is that's the gun one, and that one has. What rule? I'm, and, I'm, like, I'm completely you know, with you. I'm completely like, with you. There's a moment in the game where, like, the stalker finally shoots, and you're like, "Oh, that's where he was." I have no <laughs> idea. I don't know where that guy is. Like, he could be a brigand. They all look the same to me. I've got absolutely yeah, when, no idea. <laughs> when that pops behind a ruin and you can't see the whole model, when you're like, "Is yeah, that a stalker? Yeah, yeah. Is that a stalker or is that a brigand?" <laughs> but like, you know, you don't know. So I just, I just want to put it out there to to the viewers: these two are purported to be fairly competent players, and yet they couldn't learn two and a half data sheets. I just uh, lose that's... interest when it's that samey looking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, fine. We'll say Thousand Suns. Thousand Suns is a, a funny example. Yeah, thousand thousand, thousand Suns is a better example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So we've got like four different flavors of sorcerer that yeah. all do different things and they all look basically the same, right? Well, GSC, who the hell knows what the difference between an acolyte and a neophyte is if you don't play a GSC? No one yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, still yeah. can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. And so that's that's a. I think it's why again it's why you see people in kind of the content creation world or the international teams world do well because again they they have to think across a bunch of different things, and that baseline familiarity of thinking and playing and reading into all the different armies does sink in and is is a useful thing, right? Um, so yeah, I think I, f I feel like some of the things we talked about are sort of slightly fast food advantages, like just just tapping into something when it's a bit too good and and sort of coasting a little bit. But actually, there's from a knowledge standpoint trying to deeply understand a wider range of armies is a really positive thing right and that's something that you do get from moving from army to army, army. i think that's why it has a reputation for being the the dark side of 40k right because <laughs> it's the quick it's the quick path to power it is, right it is, it is. yeah no, ah, absolutely. a high win rate it's not a secret the jedi would teach you <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly and i think i think it's definitely part of that and i think there's 
the negative connotations it attracts are, are a range of different things. I think it's, as you say, it's partly because it's cutting corners. I think it's partly because there is a social contract dimension to saying, I'm only ever going to play this game on unfair terms for my entire life. I personally think <laughs> that, that's literally what I think. If you, if you like, if any mate who like always wanted to play a game with, <laughs> with a 60% advantage every time, you'd be like, you're not fun to play games with. This is how, it's how I would feel about it. But I think obviously the assumption at the top of a game is well, if we're all doing that, it levels out, right? So it's, it doesn't mm. really, it's not really, ha- but I think from the perspective of your average player, I think it does feel like that because you only ever encounter it when it batters you on a Sunday morning. Oh, really. God. <laughs> it's like the Tour de France. When they went back <laughs> and did all the blood doping, the person who actually won was like 16th or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Check that out, by the way. Go and have a look at how, for, how wild hilarious. cycling is. That's yeah. crazy. If, so if you want to get in the top 16, you better be at faction hopping otherwise you're um, yeah 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 cycling yeah. clean i mean which... certainly it is one of those things where in the actual at the top of the competitive game you don't see you very rarely see pure like pure specialists achieve those top top results right where, because the annoying thing with faction hopping of course is that once things line up for an army that specialist is then sharing with a bunch of people who've just jumped onto the army as well. So actually, you know, it, it, it's not, you don't get your, I think a lot of players have this idea of a sort of time in the sun, right? It's like, oh, it'll be our turn at some point, you know, we'll get, we'll get our go. But that's never how it actually works in practice because the circus comes to town on your army, basically. It's, 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 also, it's, the, the, the time in the, the sun. Yeah. It's a horrible time to be playing the faction if you're a faction specialist. Yeah, it's not fun, is it? <laughs> everyone's teching for you. You expect yourself to be doing so well. Yeah, and all these people so come in. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I think the skills you learn as well, being like constantly punching up, don't prepare you for when you're winning like all of your games without having to think. Completely. Because it's it's a completely different set of skills. And then suddenly when you're like, oh, I've got to maximize every point, you're like, oh, but I thought I was trying to scrape for every point. So instead of yes. playing cagey, I should be playing very aggressive. And you can find yourself playing yes. very differently, Drakari being an example there. No, completely that. And I, say, I, think, I think that's that's something I, I have in place. I like I, it has taken me two years to learn very aggressive shutdown scoring play right because that's not something i was again very used to playing sort of uphill when you're learning and you're playing uphill and you're struggling and just trying to do enough um and yeah that book is was crazy and so suddenly it's like when an army's that good it's like it doesn't matter where you position you shove the whole thing forward you take one hit then you kill them with everything and it's like that's that's how it goes right um let's think of some um some positives and some pros for faction specialists and then let's make the case for that i feel like that's an easy one to sing some positives about even though ed's uh, put a really provocative title down you're trying to bait scurry out here you're trying to get an argument going. fine I'll change it. <laughs> Oops, that's not it's going to be but uh nice to highlight that one <laughs> You just, you just, you know, keep talking. Yeah, you I'll, carry uh, on. All right, Rob, Rob you take, do you want to take it away on this? Yeah, um, I, I think you develop as a player a lot more being a, special, a faction specialist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, bit of a caveat, though, if you're just starting out and your faction this is, is horrible, an, this is a really you will important not be caveat. learning because you will just be getting your ass handed to you constantly yeah. and you will not be enjoying the game. There, there is yeah. a tipping point. Yeah, so I, think I think that, with... that there's for new players, as you say, it, if you're just playing an army where it's like, unless you were playing this perfectly, you wouldn't be in with a prayer of having results anyway. That's a really horrible place to start learning this game, right? That's yeah. not that's not productive. <laughs> anyway, yeah. carry on, man. Yeah, I, I think when you start hitting the kind of the three two kind of bracket, if mm-hmm. if you're in there and you're a faction specialist, you will be hitting some hard games. You'll be learning what you need to do, what happens if you do something wrong. Yeah. Um, and and the limitations of the factions and and what others do better. Yeah, no, exactly that. And and so you you get that you just have that bedded in. Again, there's a real muscle memory to it and an instinct to scenarios and situations and types of army play into each other and how to dig out of situations, yeah. um, how to steal a win. You know, being able to steal a win with an army you know really well, really important, smash and grab. Um, and you don't necessarily train those skills if you don't play your army even when it's not the best thing in the game right to, to reduce it down to another snappy tagline yes i think um <laughs> i think if you're a, a faction specialist you it makes you better at the game mm-hmm. but it doesn't give you better results necessarily I think because that's completely true. because as much as the holistic purist aspect of like yeah being really good at the game it, it, it like it doesn't necessarily like being good at the game is not necessarily what everything that you need to win tournaments in no. no, okay. um so i mean it's important obviously mm-hmm. but it's not everything that you need so um yeah you probably get 
if you want if you get if you're going for like results, you've got to get better results from uh being an opportunist. But you definitely I think you become a better player in general by being a specialist. Yeah. Just some anecdotal evidence for that. Um <laughs> I had so many easy round fives at GT when the um, the NIDS book was fairly new. Because yes. there were people who just like weren't really even capable of talking and also breathing at the same time. <laughs> were, like three in one and you just like cool. So uh I win. Yeah. <laughs> so nice. so for, that, for that one, you didn't even have the roll dice, just your opponent couldn't do roll dice to kill you. That's so yeah. Yeah. that was pretty much it, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely that and I think that's it. And I think it's you don't have the skills in adversity if you if you've not done all that uphill work and the weight training and other things. Um and again, genuine information of a faction and how to play it is really, really useful. And as you say, this isn't, this doesn't, I don't think this ever reflects results at the very top of the game. I don't think it tends to. Um, although again, you do see some amazing, you know, list creations and interesting ideas coming up through the game. I think there is the, when you're looking at like results and you're a faction specialist, you look at win rates and your, your win rate and what you're doing as well. It's, it's a different, for me, it's a different, um, different bar you're looking at you're not going completely oh am, am i am i going five am i going four one at all my events it's not useful no i'm going okay cool the faction's got a 40 percent win rate and i've got a 60 percent win rate yeah that's, exactly that. that's an exactly. achievement yeah exactly and so it's, it's slightly changing and altering how you look at it and again as i said really and again so scurry again he's in the chat but he's a good example so you know sort of the joke was that he was we weren't going to get any good jacari buffs because he was continuing to go to events and do well with real space raid it's like it's not going to help we need him to stop especially um, when only about four people were playing them well that was it dollars all for. then they were there yeah, they were not in a good way right they were not in a good way at all um, i've got a double-edged sword here mm-hmm. mostly a positive but also okay. teams like faction yes. specialists and teams yeah, 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 yeah. But when you're not one of the top like ten or eleven factions in the game, and you just don't make your international squad, well, that sucks. Better luck next yeah. year. I hope yes. they get a codex. Yeah, I've, I've felt this a little bit with with England type stuff, where it's sort of like the stuff I'm interested in playing hasn't really been in the that that top set of things, right? And it's and you're kind of like you kind of have to you get a bit stretched because you're like actually. I do want to play the things I want to play, and that's more interesting and more exciting to me than just going. I don't want to go and just play sisters or just go and play, you know, guard or something. Like that. None of that. None of that appeals to me in the slightest. Yeah, I mean, it can be. Uh, it is absolutely a blessing and a curse for teams being a faction specialist, right? Because yes. yeah, sure, you're gonna you're gonna know your matchups for your faction backwards and forwards. That's great, right? But if you're particularly if you're in the situation where you're applying for a national team, um, I'll do a. a fantasy callback way back in the day i was a vampire count specialist uh-huh. well the captain of the etc team i was applying for was also a vampire count specialist That's difficult. so i never stood a chance really so yeah, um, yeah, yeah you know it was just it was just unrealistic but the similar similar kind of thing can happen for like if you, you were um well i say a tau specialist right if you were a tau specialist and you were trying to get on team england and 40k well if tau are, are on the nerfed data slate for WTC, it's going to be really difficult for you to get on that team because they don't want a Tau player. And if you yeah, don't yeah. play Tau, then you know you're Completely. going to struggle. No, right? exactly that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Tau, and so I mean, for a good example of the last couple of years, as far as WTC goes, Tau have just been struggling because Homer's bring it down, right? It's like you know you can be as good as you like at Tau, but your opponent can take these two and get a reasonable score hiding, and you're like, that's really annoying, <laughs> that, and yeah. that makes that causes them a problem in 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 a team situation. So it's so yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting example. And again, sometimes deep. Deep faction knowledge can also just be knowing that you're not that useful in a situation. Yeah. <laughs> so I took Votan to a couple of the England events early on. We're doing major season. Like I can tell you with certainty that that is terrible. That is terrible. That is terrible. And that is terrible because yeah. I know, and that's the knowledge I bring to this. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all well and good knowing your matchups backwards and forwards. Mm. But if you if you don't have the flexibility to swap faction at all, yeah. if it's just bad, it's bad, and there's yeah. no way you're not going to get around that. You know. Um, but like similarly, if you want, as I mentioned before, adversity breeds um, uh, innovation, right? You, you, you're, you know, if you're looking around, if you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel, looking for that thing in the codex that can really switch things around. I'm sure mm-hmm. Rob has, has has gone through this kind of thing. He's like, look through our codex backwards and forwards, trying to find something, oh, and yeah. eventually he pulls something out of the barrel, and he's like, yes, it's exactly what I need. And the rest of us look at him, and it's a rotten apple core and it's like <laughs> you know he's like yes no you don't understand this is exactly what i need but it's still a rotten apple core this is know, exactly like, the yeah. right weight to set the rube goldberg machine off and so, <laughs> there's this beautiful just picture in my mind of how it works yeah 
because it, it's all one of those things where it's very easy to sit there on your high horse and be very, um, you know, uh, elitist about your faction specialism and your your mastery over it. But realistically, it can hurt you as often as oh, it helps you. It, it yeah. completely does. Um, I think that's so. the thing. And I, I think being there for the ups and downs is part of it and part of what's romanticized about it and what we like about it. Mm-hmm. But as you say, at times it will mean, yeah, frustration and feeling like you're playing with your hands tied behind your back and feeling like you're swimming uphill all sorts of things that make it really difficult um and as you say tons of useful skills come out of that um but it's like again this is a hobby we play for fun or a sport sometimes to others that we play to win and at times both of those things suffer if you're just getting your face punched in by something better than you <laughs> it, goes the, it goes the same way for for faction opportunities as well right yes, so if it you does. if you're flipping around factions it's gonna if there's data sheets that aren't being used right like I met a guard player at the weekend who didn't know what the rattling data sheet does. <laughs> but he's a guard player. It's a good rattling know, data sheet. Doesn't it? know what the rattling data sheet does. Yeah. But you know, so there's it can be if you if you're swaffling around factions a lot, there's gonna be the nuances that you don't necessarily pick I up. Agree. Um, I completely agree. But and you, actually sometimes you get rules, mistakes, and errors off the back of such behavior. And indeed we have all sorts of incidents which I would say boil down to people change factions very quickly and then <sighs> Can't think of any of those. Fast and loose with what the army actually does or how the army actually works, and some of that's accidental, and sometimes maybe that's not. Rarely Uh, seems to be to their detriment, though. It does rarely seem to be to their detriment. (laughs) That that is something that is something I tend to note as well. Um, And I do think with faction swapping, I I think there's a massive difference between someone who is incredibly read up on and lived in with the meta in the game and how they interact doing it to someone who sees on Reddit that X is good or sees a high win rate and just goes, I'll go and do that now. Um, And I've definitely seen this locally where there'll be people who cycle through armies so quickly. And you're sort of like, the best advice I can give you is, you haven't even mastered the basics of playing this game yet. And if you change the landscape on which you're playing the game every couple of months, you're sort of resetting, to be honest, because you, you, you know there's a whole bunch of new things you have to think about. Um, so it can be very detrimental, I think, especially it's, early on. So on that topic, I think if you only play one sort of tournament, it becomes much easier to faction hop. So Ooh. I don't really play anything other than UKTC. Indeed. Just, you know, time, effort, cost. I try to hit one event a month. It's probably going to be the whatever the UKTC event is. I live in the Midlands. That's where most of them are. So every game's the same. Every game's a bit paint by numbers. I know how the game plays. I know how all the factions play. You can kind of just plug and play, even if you change. It doesn't take that much I would learning agree. a new faction. No, I'd agree. I think UKTC is probably the most solved meta in the world. Uh, and and I think that's why a lot of top players like it because they know exactly what's going to happen and they're very happy with that because they don't have to think so much. Um, and uh, but I think that yeah, as you say, that that is a big part of it. And some and sort of, but again, the ability to interact with different environments or settings again is something where having good experience is useful. Um, but that definitely is definitely is a big factor. I think. Um, where are we on now? Are we on cons. <laughs> We we've just done, probably we've, about we've finished the positives for both. I think we've yeah. about okay. So so we'll do we'll, we'll do if there's any more cons for either you can think of, chuck them in. But I feel I feel like we've ruminated on a lot of it. But then I say anything else you guys are thinking, chuck it in whilst we're here. Uh, this will be, this is your time to say your piece on all of this, Jack. So I've I've set you up for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I I've basically covered everything that I think. Yeah. Um, I think is I I have to to say on it really. I mean, yeah. Um, as I say, it's easy to romanticize one over the other. Um, but ultimately, there's no there's no wrong way. I don't think no. to do it. I think there's there's oh there's definitely wrong ways. Yeah. See, <laughs> the the wrong way is generally to have heads. Badly. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, 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 I'm with you on that. Yeah. Um, I, I do think yeah you can you can do both badly, right? You can definitely specialize badly, and you can yeah I think opportunistic badly as well. I think both um, sort of schools of thought have their own um, strengths and weaknesses to the point where it kind of all comes out in the wash. Yeah. You basically just get the advantage of your faction is a high, it's just stronger numerically, so you'll get a higher win rate. That's kind of like the the main um, benefit of, of yes. being. Uh, um, yeah. That's it. It's right. like, li- yeah. li- is it, do you have a list advantage or an experience advantage? That that's mm-hmm. that's what it is in the end when you get to higher yes. tables. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it it all kind of like comes out in the end. So, I think you can, um, like, if you if you want to be a faction specialist and get to the top, you probably can, right? Are you going to win a two hundred man super major with uh, I don't know, orcs right now? <laughs> probably not. 
No, yeah, but um, here's the secret. You probably weren't going to fucking win it anyway. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, that size, there, there's a pretty short list of people I'd expect to win those routinely. This is, yeah. this is what I'm saying, right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Like, if you're going to, say, like a 32 man GT, mm-hmm. then being the faction special, like, that can be enough to get you over the line, right? It really but, can. Yeah. But when you start, like, ultimately, if players are better than you, they're going to beat you, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're an opportunist <laughs> or a specialist. Like, yeah. you know, you didn't see just because Eldar were really good and they had like nearly 70% win rate, you didn't say, see Joe Random come and win LGT, right? Mm-hmm. It was someone who knew exactly what they were doing. Yes. Who, yeah, yeah. who won LGT. So it's, you know, it, it'll take you a good way, right? Mm-hmm. And it probably, like, it probably make you a lot of uh, enemies at your local, <laughs> right? Uh, being a, being an opportunist. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a free ticket the whole way. Um, which is why I normally say it, it brings you probably up a win bracket for where your skill is. Mm-hmm. If you're a 3-2 player, it might bring you to a 4-1, but it's not going to win the event for you, right? No, so. I think that's right. Yeah, and, and, and unless you hit completely bonkers, shades are broken. Um, and yeah, I, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't do that. It doesn't do that lifting. Um, and I do, I mean, I think just like someone in the chat has mentioned, we've got um, Callum Freeman says, I, you know, I don't have the mental bandwidth with three kids and little hobby time to faction hop. So one faction per edition for me and allows me to slow grow them. I think that's another thing with this is that it is, you know, the game is not purely about the competitive side. And it is a case of one thing I've definitely found with changing armies is that you just develop a kind of sort of negative attitude towards the hobby and painting side because it just feels like a rush, it just feels like something you're trying to do very quickly. Um, and I enjoy painting and hobby a lot more when it's just for its own sake and it's kind of detached from. Hold the on. Are you trying to say that you can paint not to a deadline, and that's just yes. a thing that's possible? I'm basically wedded to always doing that now. I don't really want to ever be just cramming stuff through for a deadline again. I can't be bothered. Yeah. Rob's getting his banshees ready for the banshee meta. <laughs> <laughs> and some people, it's going to shock you. Some people paint for fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually quite like painting. Um, yeah, I got yeah, my. Yeah. I spent quite a lot of time on this boar with all his individually highlighted furs. That was the end of my point. And okay. Tyranny <laughs> says, with the rise of three D printers, will we see more army helpers? I think yes. We already have. I think we definitively have. Here's yeah. the thing: the only people who think that three D printers will be the death of the hobby are the people with three D printers. Um, the vast, vast majority of people don't even know they exist. Yes, for sure. It's, but uh, I think I think within within the top of the game, I think I've seen there's been a lot more printing and and speed speeding through of armies now. There, there has, but I remember just lots of you know buying an army, selling an army. So oh, I don't yeah. know if it's if it's any different other than maybe no. it costs people a little bit less money, so maybe it makes no, it a little sure. easier to do. And I would um, I would say from an army hopping standpoint, the thing that has facilitated it more actually is TTS. I think, yeah. and I think, I think yeah. over the last few years, a significant portion of the players in the competitive scene view this more as a video game than they do as a sort of full rounded sort of creative hobby in that sense. And a lot of them came straight out of TTS where they were playing it first and foremost as a video game during the pandemic, right? And, and that makes complete sense. That's a very logical way of looking at and understanding the game. But it really reinforces that, well, if I need a new tool, I just literally go on my Steam workshop, download the units for a new tool and I'm off. There's not even, you know, it takes 10 seconds. It's not that hard. Yeah, I mean, that's a super common thing in like yeah. competitive video gaming, right? Like, so take um, like you know, games like your Dota, your League of Legends, World of Warcraft, um, but any of those, right? Let's say your class gets nerfed by, I don't know, f- 5% less damage, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that a meaningful, like, does it actually change anything? Probably not. But do you see the play number, like, rock, like, absolutely go through the floor when that happens? Mm. Of course you do, because it's a, it's a, it's a mental thing, right? So even when you get, like, nerfs come through, I think, again, they use Chaos Space Marines again, their nerfs were, very large but yeah. their, pro- their play rate pro- proportionally has dropped off so much dramatically yeah yeah like there's no um like there's probably more than uh is justified by the changes that they got mm-hmm. um but to go in like the, the other direction like the, the hobby sort of stuff um you were mentioning about right i think a good, a, mm. an example of this is when with drakari when sky splinter came out i'm gonna bet rob had every basically every model he needed to run Whatever Sky Spinner the C one is straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, that's a so, big difference and a big advantage. Yeah. When you have a large collection, just go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you have that's, a large... I think add, uh, that's probably another feature of faction, especially more at least faction passion is you. You do you just collect across it, right? And you don't have everything because it was good at one point. You have it. Oh, here we go. Is this orc buggies or something? Is it orc buggies coming <sighs> no, back? Briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> light up. 
<laughs> I seem to have accidentally locked this. What's that? <laughs> I don't know what the code is. Yeah. It's, th- it's three zeros. That's three zeros. Zeros. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to hold this briefcase full of orc models. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly right. Sky Splinter came out, and you just, you know, we had all the right stuff. I bought five more incubi oh, I, I wanted five, five incubi. more incubi. That was <laughs> yeah. it. I was like, oh, 20 incubi suddenly feels fun. So I'm going to do that, and then good to go, right? Yeah. And that I makes think... adapting very easy. Yeah. And I do think you get a lot of. Um sort of uh sort of boy scout points i think for just like having that big army of like because you have you're gonna have a large collection and it's all gonna be like probably uh, like a similar standard of, of paint quality yeah right um i'm not gonna name any names there was a person who i saw at a very large uktc event with um uh accursed cultists and those units were basically painted essentially one color but it was like a different color for each unit so you know which one was which yeah that looked pretty bad, and I'm yeah, a, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm a person who is very much of the opinion that you are not entitled to a right to play against a nice looking army. Yeah, yeah because yeah. there's there's people out there with different levels of skill, people out there with disabilities, people trying to paint, but all this sort of stuff. I don't think you're entitled to play against an army that looks good. Even I was like, that's a bit much, right? Yeah. And I think that you can get that a lot when you're doing For very sure. rapid. Um, yeah, yeah. switches of, of armies. Oh, and I, I, the game changes so quickly now that actually it's almost yeah, three months, right? Possible, right? Yeah. That's it. I think balance is now not only, it's not purely tied to releases because the slates change things much more dramatically. It's happening every three months. So the game simply changes too quickly for, you know, you, if you get a fix on a meta army, it's going to be gone by the next one. And then it's like, it might be gone for the rest of the edition as far as, you know, that whatever it is you're seeking is concerned. And it's the stuff you want to buy, you can't buy it because... Yeah, it's not in no, stock. That as well, yeah, exactly. Try and buy Tetris, like you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. You can't do it. So, and when you do play against like a genuinely beautifully painted army, it's the best thing in the world. I mean, I just, just, just shout out to sort of Paulie with his his real space Drakari, you know, the orange Drakari. They're stunning, just absolutely beautiful. Right? And that's, that's years of obsessing over that army. Nothing, nothing scares me more than an Eldar army that's been hand painted and not airbrushed, because <laughs> I know they've been playing it for a while, right? Yeah, like, they know yeah, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. like if I see the airbrush, I'm like, okay, it's not going to be that bad, right? No, exactly. They might forget a fate dice here and there. Yeah. No, <laughs> there, were, there were a lot of slightly wobbly star weavers uh, with very bad airbrush paint jobs. And you're like, I think I'll be all right here. I think this, <laughs> I think this will be fine. <laughs> My favorite. Is, um, I'm not going to name any names. It's not going to name and shame. But one of my we're not, we're not naming and shaming on this show. From today, a previous yeah. team had a 3D printed Maliceptor at the height of Maliceptor fame. Um, they didn't have the scale right. It was about two hundred percent. It was so big. <laughs> it's just like a, just an absolute paperweight, still on the right base, spilling over in every dimension. <laughs> it was like I don't even know how you put paint on that and go. Maybe this is right. No, it was horrendous. I, I mean, that's a good point. Actually, Malasad was a really good example of another benefit to being a faction specialist. Again, large collections, right? Stuff yeah, comes who, out who had if Malaceptors, it's terrible. Right? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I remember way back when when I was but a wee teenager and I was <laughs> listening to a forty k podcast and the week that the um, uh, Malaceptor came out and everyone was like, "This is." fucking shit and no one would ever take it <laughs> but you know eventually it'll come around again right obviously yeah. there's the downside if you're a space marine player you know and your entire faction gets destroyed like or half your models get destroyed and taken out of circulation but like for most other factions that's not really a, yeah. I a think good, an issue good examples for, for Drakari you know all the new bits that came out for Drakari weren't that good for the first cycle of them being out and then got good, right? So Drazal came out, he was kind of fine. But then in ninth, he was amazing. Lilith came out, kind of fine. And then in 10th, amazing. And it's like, if you've actually just gone and got and collected those things because you're doing that, then suddenly you're sat yeah. on the thing that's good. You don't have to run and buy it immediately. Triple back, to, back to what we were talking about, because we got slightly derailed. I've just realized Games Workshop are so petty that if you are good in an edition, you will pay for your sins the next edition. That's exactly how they do it, yeah. I mean, what are the two best armies of last edition? Drakari and Nids. What are the two most anemic armies on launch? Drakari and Nids. Add add mech to that. There was a, there was a yeah, whole add, list. Add, I would yeah. say there was there was a literal list of naughty step armies. I would agree. Jesus. I think a whole bunch of the... But again, you think about when 10th was written. and Think about what was happening in 9th when 10th was written. Think about who the baddies were at that moment in time. Yeah, might well be. <laughs> Games Workshop employees. Might well be. 
prefer that that was a part of it. But then orcs were also bad for a bit, and orcs got a pretty fun index. I felt. They were yeah, they were they were bad early enough in the edition that it's been forgotten, and they were also weren't the best army in the game at any point. They were struggling with Admech and at the start, and then Drakari as they came out. Um, they ended up being the third of the top three armies. Stanley Pedal, hello by the way. It says the ability to glance at your shelf and have lots of freedom of what you want to take on list submission day is quite freeing and relaxing. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think again, if you're if you're just like your army, like your faction, enjoy playing it. And taking something weird and wonderful, go for it. You know, right. I have to. I have to imagine if you were like, if you if you were a, a faction opportunist and you like played Drakari when they were really good in ninth edition, and then they got nerfed, and then you sold that army, right? And then it comes back around again where a bunch of those units are good again, and you want to buy it, right? I, that's got to be soul destroying. I can't imagine. Never sell I'm your not, army. I'm not Never gonna. I'm not army. going to name names, but someone I helped to play Drakari back in the day. When their moment passed and they wanted to play Harlequins, I was like, if you sell this now, you will buy it again. And they, <laughs> they just bought their Drakari army again about two weeks ago. I can't remember who it is, but there's someone who has been taken note of in our group chat. And every time they sh sell an army on Facebook, someone posts a picture in the group chat. He's like, he's done it again. I can't remember who it is. But it does come up genuinely every two to three it months. it is that person, but it might be that person. Um, and so, and it's, it gets a bit pathological at that point. Now, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Cause I think there is, there's actually an underlying financial dimension to this, I suppose, is worth commenting on, which is that a lot of people can't afford to be buying a new army every few months, right? That's, that's crazy money. And that, I mean, that probably explains partly the kind of sell, rebuy, whatever else kind of pattern. Um, and so it is a bit of a luxury that some people have and others don't um, in that sense as well. It's not just financial, it's time, isn't it? Like getting oh, Time is a big one. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. To get, to get 2,000 points up and ready, for me, takes months, months, months. I know, I know, Ed, you can get them smashed out pretty quickly. I realized that um, after I painted my th three killer cans, I was like, there is no way I'll have this done by the time the book is out. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to happen. That's a good point. I need to buy some more Dirty Down Rust because my last one's really Yeah, hard. yeah. Get those texture paints on. Stonks, stonks and Dirty Down Rust are about to go up. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, man. You, there is no way on God's Green Earth I will paint three more Riptides. So they're staying in my collection forever. Yeah, you just keep those. Like, you it's just not keep those. And they'll be good again. They, they, will, they, they always come back in the end. Yeah. They always they'll get nerfed back. and then they'll be good again. And... Yeah, yeah. But I guess that's the benefit of having a small... Like a relatively small uh, roster, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think yeah, I've got exactly. about seven thousand points of Drukari, and that's basically three of every unit. Yeah, exactly. It, that it, it's it's an upside of having a small. I think the, the only two armies I have that for are Drukari and GSC, probably. And again, GSC is not a big range, right? So it's like you have the stuff, you, you know, yeah. and, and that's the nice thing about it. When their rules do change, you're like, right, I'm good to go. Um, and so that's 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 quite fun. That's a nice position to be in, and that's probably your best shot at being both a specialist but also someone who can adapt right is having that collection you're ready to go as and when there are good changes um, I th and you so i think it's an interesting question for you guys i want to know your opinion in an mm -hmm. ideal world do you think most 40k players should be or like would you want them to be specialists or would you want them to be opportunists if if, if money was like no object mm -hmm. and, it, and people could just so say it was like uh effectively as easy as swapping a character in a in a pc game right or whatever and you could be a faction specialist and or an opportunist and just swap whenever you want, or you could be a specialist and know all the factions. What do you, what do you think would be better? Like, which would you prefer? I guess I, I like specialists more than opportunists. I just straight up do. I mean, that's why we do. We just state state of play is about people who actually know the the army as well. And it's like, and it's yeah, I I would rather that. I pre I prefer that game. And what I would love is for competitive outcome to not be so explicitly linked to opportunism. Right? It, how dull is it when you rock up to a, an event and three out of your five games are against the same list? Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> that's a different that's a different problem though which is the echo chamber effect on list creativity and also 10th edition not being yeah. very interesting that's a whole other episode that we that could is. do right so we'll, we'll come we to that because i think players have got less and less imaginative even in the two or three years i've played this game and i'd Definitely. love to do an episode where we just shout i I, you know, I, I mean, I'm down for that. I, that's, that's, that's what I do when I'm not on camera. But um, that's partially 10th edition. Like, yeah, the I, dumbing I down agree. of the rules. Writing. I literally just don't need to write lists anymore. It's so yeah. sad. I just well, have, I mean, one, I have one of each army just at the top, and you're like, that's it. That's that's one of the things that I think is an advantage for faction hopping or um, opportunity, sorry, because if you enjoy the list building aspect of it, yeah. you get very oh, bored completely. very quickly when you write for one faction. Uh, I had to pick up a whole new game just to, you know, keep fresh. So now I'm built writing lists in Old World and 40k yeah, just to keep I mean, my first going. And I, I do think that kind of brain itch of let's test it, try it out, figure it mm. out is is really fun. Right, that's how my like my, my Night Lords happened. I regret it for. I played Blood Angels earlier. I'm so never bad. playing Blood Angels again. 
Yeah. I was just like, <laughs> I want to see how this works. I think they're decent blues. Yeah, it was really good. All right. I think any any closing comments, guys, before we move it on to some questions? I'm good. We nailed it. Well done, us. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Be whichever one you want, people. Just be good at it. I don't mind how you do it. Um, okay, so we Just now... one, one I... thing. Yep. If you're one of them, don't say you're the other one. All right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> yes. No one likes that. No one likes that. If you're an opportunist, that's fine. Just own it, right? Yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, yeah, say yeah. you're a specialist. Or similarly, if you're a specialist and you play like five armies, but you play each of them like once a month, don't say you're a specialist either. Yeah. Uh, if you're an I think, I think that's like... part of it. And I think the other thing is also lay off the other kind as well. There's no need to don't 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 get on a high horse and go and whinge at whatever the people who play it they're not the way you play it. Like don't exactly. waste too, don't yeah. waste time on that. And yeah, have some have some self awareness about what you are is always useful, right? <laughs> and if you are a faction opportunist, try and fix that bit of your brain that tells you to be a special snowflake and just run the third or fourth best army. Stop doing it. Just run the best army. <laughs> if, if, you like, gonna, if, if you are gonna talking directly to do me, it. Yeah, if you are gonna do it you might as well stop, stop playing the thing that's quite good but not the best and just go i'm gonna play the best army it's fine you can do that i don't think i could do that i don't we've think got I um our first questions come through from entropic tyranny and they say who will get buffs in the next data slate any predictions uh admec admec yeah Ad no they'll, they'll get i something. think I think Admech players are just where you know the gimps of forty k go. Uh, the the self flagellating, the the masochists. Oh, step <laughs> on me, nerf my army harder. So I think Games Workshop needs to funnel them into one army for all of our sakes. Hmm. I think that's demon players from my experience. No, demon players get very <laughs> very whingy when they don't have good rules. Yeah, Admech probably feel like one that will get a buff. Um, hmm. I don't think stuff like GSC will get touched because it's got a book coming. That's the, the thing, isn't it? Might get touched. Yeah, I I just want them to run back the um, the change to their um, bondsman abilities. Yeah, if they yeah. if they run that back, I think they're in like a still sub fifty percent win rate, but in a better place. There'll probably be something random. Slate changes will be buffs to internal balance, so you see more very builds, not just. The yeah, it'll be. I think it'll just be points. When I think it'll just be points. That'd be actually. nice. Yeah, so it won't happen. The problem yeah. I find is that with the taking away of, well, basically moving us over to power level, essentially, yeah. is that it's very difficult to, to alter internal balance of points now. Yeah, I completely agree. Where it used to be. It more gets changed by um, data sheet abilities. Um, mm. But uh, in terms of, I, I reckon something really random is going to get buffed. Um, oh, like, I, I don't always. know, like T-Suns yeah. or something will just get <sighs> randomly that, get. That, that would be a huge mistake, I think. Yeah. Uh, I just mean like, you know, it's, oh yeah, River Cry Terminators have gone down by 25 oh, be, points a model or, some, or something, right? The you don't right? see, actually. Yeah, the Terminators mm. you don't see. But yeah, uh, there'll be 25 yeah. points a model. Yeah, yeah, yeah something, it'll be something ridiculous, right? Yeah. There'll be so, a typo in there. We're yeah. running five point Terminators or something. Oh my word. And then of course you will um, inevitably have the um, the now re tr annual tradition, or not annual, but it's like quarterly tradition of um, the Tyranid buff nerf of we're, <laughs> yes. gonna, we're going to um, randomly change one thing up by 50 points and one thing down by 25 points and yeah. it's not really going to change anything and then we'll just I think I think we're on currently we're on a buff for the Tyrone effects so we'll put the Tyrone effects back up 50 points <laughs> so and then the it next data slate we'll, the same role. Yeah, yeah and then and then the next data slate we'll just put it back down 50 points again it's behind my computer I'm not going to grab my Tyrone effects <laughs> <laughs> We'll just keep putting it up and down. I've got one in a box if you want a second one, Ed. That's not that's never I happened. don't even want one. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love that model. Um, it was Chris, so good. Christopher Richardson says on data sheet abilities, then what's one change to a data sheet that you would most like to see? <sighs> Please give me a new data sheet role for the broadside battle suits. A four plus feel no pain against small wounds is fucking worthless mm. and makes no sense. Just that that's is fair. fair. Does it it's not work so on dev? No. That's really sad. <laughs> That's really sad. But here's, here's, here's a data set ability I would actually like to see changed. Uh, it's to the... Oh, there's two, actually. I want to see one for um, uh, the battle tactic change for the zero CP. I think mm -hmm. instead of it being what it is now, it should be you either choose if the said strat is free or you use it for a second time. I don't think you should get both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that would be a better change than the battle tactic nonsense we have now. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And the other one, I think, is the dev wound change should be keep it doing more wounds instead of the weird like limbo it's in now. But mm. you just can't kill more models than you do wounds. 
Yeah, that's where it is currently, isn't it? Uh, yes, different... but they're not they're not mortal wounds. <laughs> right, so protection against mortal wounds. They, they just need yeah. to change all protection against mortal wounds to be mortal wounds and death wounds. I think that's the cleaner way of doing it. It's, it's the same same end way. I think it yeah. just uh, one, it's just semantics, but it ends up being the same thing, right? For sure. Yeah, I'd like to see um, the, the Dark Angels unit, whatever they're called, the, um, the, the sword bearers, whatever. Inner circle companions. Inner circle companions, yeah. I'd like to see them not terrible. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, what do they do now? No, they sit on shelves. <laughs> yeah. I think they're more expensive and worse than Blade Guard is basically all I remember, and they immediately went out of my brain. I looked at mm. it, and was like, "Oh, that's bad." Anyway, let's look at good units. Are there any good Drakari ones, Rob? <laughs> I just want a new Hellions data sheet because oh, really Hellions, yeah, yeah, just... Hellions. What, what even is their data? Oh, they can fall back they and charge. Fall back still. and charge. Yeah. I think but, that'd be all right I mean, if they weren't. If, made if, if they could actually charge something, it might be good. Yeah, yeah. W- just being infantry wouldn't be enough, would it? I don't think. Uh, yeah, I think it would. Be. <laughs> you think it would? Yes, yeah, because they're AP two with pain tokens now. That's true, and sustained on the five. Yeah, five. yeah. I'll be yeah, honest, you being like it. Getting breachable just kind of makes a lot of things better. Like the ability yeah. to move through a ruin wall yeah. is a lot. It's, it's kind of all that a lot of stuff. There we go. Maybe that's all in crisis suits heavy. become infantry. That'd be that, incredible. That would be absolutely enormous for Tau at this moment in time. I think they'd be such a, a worthwhile army to well, play. The, the at list that you point. could do. Old school flyback. You can't. You can't say <laughs> stuff like that on this podcast. Ed. I I need some blood left in my brain to continue podcasting. So <laughs> you, to, you know. All but right. uh, yeah, if, if in all seriousness, if that happened, I think Tau would be the best army in the game. Yeah. Not even, not even kidding. I think they would be ridiculously good. Uh, you know, I don't even know if that's true. Because the suits are so much worse than they were. I think it just means that you can take them without it being such a negative now. Yeah. yeah. I think you're probably going to see like one or two units now. But mm. yeah. It's, uh, I think I they do, would I be, think be good, ridiculously but... strong if that was the case. Yeah. Retaliation cadre would be absolutely nuts. Oh god. That would be lovely. I would. I, th- I still think it wouldn't be the best. I think you'd still take one car and just put suits in it. That would be <laughs> the, uh, the way forward. Oh, take me back. Also, give me a melee tau data sleep while we're just, you know. Have you seen it? the monk, the picture on the monk car uh, index? They've all got swords. Yeah. They've all got swords. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, upsets yeah. me on a primal <laughs> just level. Let, just let them have swords. Like that's all we want. Just some yeah. melee crisis would be amazing. Why did you draw swords them with swords? swords? swords <laughs> They're doing it to bait me. <laughs> Why did you draw them with swords? It's so brutal. It's so brutal. Right, well, I've got some questions coming out of our Discord. Go. Is infiltrate and scout. Don't give any units both those. Yeah, that's so fucking dumb. If you're going to infiltrate, have a risk attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. That is really annoying. Really, really annoying. I can't believe scouts are still only 65 points. They're bonkers. (laughs) That's like, (laughs) how is that okay? (laughs) It's not okay. It's It's not. But, uh, um, yeah. Right, I'm going to pick some out of the Discord. We have Sai who says, "Does having access and wanting to play one or two other armies mean you are no longer a faction specialist?" No. In the eyes of the plus in brackets, does it mean that the specialist has a wider appreciation as he experiences these other factions? I mean, I'd lean towards the latter, right? I think. I mean, when your second faction is Yunari, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you, as, as we've already kind of alluded to, you can definitely be a specialist in multiple factions. I guess the question would be: Do you, if you don't ever play those factions except when they're like the best thing ever, are you really a specialist in it, or are you just a specialist in what's really, really good? Yeah. If you only own like Eldar Marines and Necrons, and then you played Eldar when they were good, and then you switched over to Marines and the Codex came out, and then now you're on Necrons, that's probably army opportunist. But <laughs> yeah, at the same time, exactly if if you're the kind of person that only gets in like one game a month and switches like every month, you're probably not a faction specialist on those three either. No. Like just so. a casual player, aren't you? And that, I yeah. think I don't think Playing either army opportunists or faction specialists are casual. I think they've already gone way past that. At the, yeah, 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 yeah. At I, that point, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. So I, I don't. I'd say I, I, we we love the the one army faction specialist kind of idea. It's a lovely idea, but I think you can absolutely be multiple armies um, brain seller asks what kind of faction specialist would be the worst to be stuck in a lift with alone for five hours oh custodies yeah it would be custodies or eldar eldar also pretty bad it's a finesse army i'm actually really good i'm very i'm very good i've actually always played eldar i just <laughs> i just started i just started playing the game in 10th edition this is this is a sub <laughs> a sub genre i 
fucking hate is someone across the table of you. Maybe we should do a skit about this when I see Chris tomorrow, but someone who's across the table from you desperately trying to persuade you the wider like cultural aesthetic of the reason they're playing this 67% <laughs> win rate army that they're about to absolutely annihilate. Yeah. Uh-huh. uh-huh. With the, meta, yeah, with yeah. the absolute like hardcore yeah. meta belts. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, yeah, no, you don't understand. Yeah. Like, it's... it's like, there is no need. It's okay. You don't, I've you don't, included, need, don't need to trace I, it back. I've included one, un- one wave serpent. That makes it a fluff list. I've got a fluff list with Mortari and a great unclean one tomorrow, and it's going to have a horrible time. But I'm I'm excited to see how it gets on. Um, Next question. Oh, I mean, I think custodians for that question. Rob, what faction specialist would you not want to be stuck in a lift with? The faction specialist who isn't a faction specialist. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You could just smell the bullshit coming off. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, if you had to pick just one faction to play against forever, what faction would you choose? Not limited to just current rules, but any general play styles or army themes. Marines, because there's so many data sheets, there's so many different archetypes you could run play against. It's not yeah. just that Drakari kill them really hard. And I barely have the Marines, so I'm, I'm on board with that. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I was going to say Chaos, Space Marines for the same reason. They also have a lot of ally options. Oh, yeah, which are very fun. Uh, yeah. Like you can do knights and you can do demons in there. Yeah, true. I wouldn't want to play against just one army forever. I'd go insane. No, it'd be so That's dull. my idea of actual purgatory. But I guess maybe orcs because fun, silly, yeah. lots of different yeah. models. Yeah, just getting a ward at twice just a game, every game for the rest of your life. <laughs> Every every yeah. game you get to queue through a hundred models, and you're like, I feel like I've achieved something. Yeah, yeah, you get yeah. Forty points because yeah, you've got yeah. no primary. Exactly. Can you use the stomper next time? I'm not enjoying it. Teach you how much of an advantage does it give a faction specialist to play something that no one else does? And I think it's worth pointing out that Sai, who plays exclusively Imperial agents, <laughs> has responded to this question with a shush face. Uh, I think it depends how well it does. It definitely gives you an advantage, but also it depends how much of a, a shit you are. If you're playing a faction that people don't know, and then you deliberately don't tell people the the niche things or if you're playing a unit that other people don't that's the thing yeah yeah is that I'm not... just playing unsportingly rather yeah than... i'm not pointing any fingers here at all like genuinely yeah, yeah, yeah. not but like when i was at manchester a couple of weeks ago my venatari allow me to rapid ingress two units and if i hadn't pointed that out to opponents in the pre-game chat i think those games would have gone very differently and it would yeah, be yeah. much much easier for me to win games yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. just not on for sure yeah. for sure i think you um in terms, of, like I, I think GSC is a great example. People generally don't know what GSC oh, do, right? Uh, like yeah. at, at every event I took GSC to, you have four games where they find out what that does, mm, and then yeah. one game where they know what you're going to do, and that's the hard game. And then <laughs> right? you have stuff like if you want to get like, to like a team's perspective, right? Um, or even just a singles perspective, it's the same thing. Um, we've already mentioned it, but if you play something that no one else plays probably a reason no one else is playing it so it's probably there's a good chance that it's not like very good which mm-hmm. in a team's um situation can be quite detrimental for the team uh or if you play if you're trying to get onto like your national team it can prevent you from getting on the national team just because you play mm. a faction that while you're very good at that faction it's if, it, if it's not what what fits in the team then you just kind of uh, screwed yourself um, and I'll, t- I'll tell you from being inside those kinds of conversations is if you do cook up ideas, or I'm, I'm, I'm not, this isn't me, other watch other people cook ideas. That idea that's yours won't be your idea for very long. It'll yeah. be someone else's <laughs> idea very loudly and very aggressively in mm-hmm. lots of that games. That sounds on almost TTSC. like having a, a YouTube almost. channel and making content <laughs> ideas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That. It just it just goes. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking things, and I'm just I'm like, don't, don't say it. Don't be say good. it. Everybody, be good. We're, gonna, hey, we're, we're, we're a nice show. We're a nice show, and we're going to move on to the next uh, question. It does give you some advantage. Does it give you enough? Maybe not. Um, Hannibal asks, "What were the hosts' first 40k armies?" That's a fun question. Ed, what was your first 40k army? So, I started playing when I was eight, and I picked up models from the market stall in Durham Market. Um, but it would have been Space Marines, I think, realistically, just because mm-hmm. that was what was easy to get. And then, um, just to complete the answer, when I came back to the Hobby in 8th edition after a, like eight-year break, uh, it was Space Marines. Nice. Rob, what was your first RV? Um, I got the third edition starter box that was Space Marines and Drukari. Hey, Ooh. look at this! Look at that yeah. for an origin story all the way back. Yeah. Genuine, genuine lineage can be traced here. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. How about you, Jack? 
Uh, Tyranids, actually. Okay, um, okay. Because I got the little, there was like a little star box, so you got like three or four gaunts oh, in it. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so yeah. I got that. One and of those paint boxes. Yeah, like that was my first like army, I guess. I didn't do a full like full army, but that was the first like collection of models I had. Mm. First full army I did was Raven God Space Marines. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I painted some salamanders when I was like eight, but then first army I played was Death Guard when I came back in. And those Keeping Death Guard, green. those Death Guard are yeah, I like green's my favorite color. I love green. Um, I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> um, the Death Guard are getting a run out in the back row tomorrow, so that'll be fun. Incredibly non optimized list. God help me. Um, <laughs> that's going to be really fun. Cool. Okay, and then six plus plus Edward, who is our Edward, wants to know: Is it pronounced Wa? Or wag with a so G this is, at the end. This isn't a question that needs asking. This is just an opportunity to have a run, rant. How many words in the fucking English language have the GH pronounced at the end? It's non you daft. But it's like, it's it's wa. There's no argument to be had. How many people have you seen mispronounce it? It drives me batty. It's, it's, it's war, right? They're saying war, like as in we're going to war. So they say, whoa, whoa. I don't know right? if that's right, but... I think that's what it's meant. To. It's like a bastardization of English, right? Mm. Here's one that annoys me, right? Satan. It's pronounced Satan. Is it? Like Satan, right? Ah, the Deathbringer, like Satan, okay. right? I like Isn't Catan, it? though, because Settlers of Catan. Yeah, I... <laughs> is it actually pronounced? <laughs> I can I, see it. I can I'm pretty see sure it. it is. I think, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is pronounced Satan. Because uh, see, this is in... this is twice that you've, you've assigned meaning to words where there is objectively no meaning <laughs> assigned. <laughs> so I, I feel like that kind of ruins your argument. Yeah, but I mean, this is the age-old wargamer strategy of say something confidently enough, and everyone will believe you. Yeah, yeah unless you and have Ed some is, of the Ed other is side. Never going to tell you off for that, right? You're <laughs> yeah. not going to. You're not, not going to catch any heat from Ed. Oh, about hold that. on, yeah. where's your <laughs> fucking proof, mate? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there was like some. There's definitely. I've definitely read some like Necron fluff about how the Satan were like a lot of depictions of demons and devils and in history were actually set. Like the the Grim Reaper is actually the Nightbringer and it's just been imprinted on cultural. Mm. Uh, how does that guys. work? Warm has only been around for about forty years. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but yeah, I'm sure I've seen that in in the lore somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I always say it's Satan because makes mm. sense. Yeah, yeah. I'd always, I'll always say Catan. Yeah. Now you will. I, I did before. Although but... you, although you go about it differently, you can both respect each other and see the good in the approach that you're taking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't respect him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ed, 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 play, play nice with the faction specialist, Ed. Can't make me. <laughs> Um, I the, in Dawn of War, the, the in the intro, you may remember there's that bit where all the orcs put their little weapons up and they all shout, and they, it just sounds like they're screaming "war" at the top of their heads. To be honest, I think I don't think the G features particularly dominant. Oh, I forgot that's what we were arguing about. Yeah, that, I just thought I just thought I'd bring it back to the original the big, original start point. Big fan of war orcs. Well, that's it. I figure is that not just where it comes from potentially? Mm. But I don't know. I don't know mm. enough about orcs. Well, I, I think they also don't speak English, so I don't know if that's. You know, a slight limiting factor. Well, they're all the... Cockneys in the 40k universe for some reason. Which is hilarious. <laughs> Which I'm is a big fan funny. of that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, I, I've seen stuff. Everyone speaks English in space. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. So in those in Fire, in Fire TV Fire, documentaries. They little tiny bits of bad Chinese as well, to be fair. Yeah. They did at least try, but that's about it. <laughs> right. Okay. I think that's us done. If you have any last minute questions in the chat, do feel free to fire them off. There was something about Sussex. Dom is still talking. What are you saying, Dom? What are you allowed to take to Hellstorm? Not going to tell you. Figure it out. And then he says, I'm buzzing. I might have to play CSM to settle the bet. Yeah, play CSM. That'd be fun. That'd be a very faction specialist no, thing you, you to do, Tom, wouldn't it? Come on. You, you wouldn't dare. <laughs> or, if, or if he would, it'll be because he's seen the boards and he'll bring a bunch of indicators. But either way, you know, an opportunist at heart. We love you guys. <laughs> um, and on that note, we will sign off. Thanks very much for tuning in. Please do hit like, subscribe, leave comments. Um, and obviously, yeah, do consider signing up to be a member and supporting us. It means the world. We will see you again next time. I can't remember exactly what we're talking about. It might be a general 10th edition, yay or nay kind of review, seeing where we feel with the game at this moment in time. Um, but yeah, see you then. May it, hopefully we'll start just as chaotically as we started this episode. Bye. <laughs>